Okay, well, my general assignment in this series of three lectures is to um, explain some aspects of chapter two of the notes that Andrew Wiles prepared for this conference. Um, I'm referring to his annals paper. Um, <laughs> now, um, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about um, a theorem which he just quotes from the literature. This is the same theorem that Dick Gross began talking about during his lectures here. And um, unlike um, Wiles, who of course wants to do things in the greatest possible generality, I will stick to the um, most salient case, which is that where you begin with some elliptic curve. And we're going to assume that it's some semi-stable elliptic curve over Q. And we are interested in proving ultimately that this elliptic curve is modular. And we begin with a very um, fragmentary piece of information. Namely, what we're going to do is we're going to take some prime, which is different from 2. And we will consider the representation, which could be called simply rho bar from G, which is the Galois group of Q, um, into GL2 um, F3, or the automorphisms of the three division points of P of this elliptic curve, um, which, um, <laughs> right, p equals 3. We're going to take um, the automorphisms which are defined um, by the p division points of this elliptic curve. And um, the two assumptions that you make are, number one, that rho bar is irreducible. And as various people have mentioned during their lectures, this means that it's absolutely irreducible. And the other thing which you want to um, consider, you want to assume, is that rho bar um, is modular in the sense that it um, comes from some space of modular forms. And um, the goal is to show that rho bar is modular in some very restricted sense. And um, what's the best way to do that? Well, the best way is to define um, some conductor so um, let's let n, for the moment, well, let's uh, first consider n of rho, which is um, the conductor n of rho bar, will be the conductor of rho bar, um, as defined by um, Dick Gross in his lectures, meaning the conductor, um, the Artin conductor, is defined by Serre. And um, an integer n, which can be defined, is then going to be um, either n of rho itself, n of rho bar, or the product of n of rho bar um, with p, um, according as something does or does not happen. Um, the first case is the case where um, rho bar, um, let's say, is not um, what Dick called um, très ramifié um, at the prime number p. So this means that um, the weight, which is attached to rho bar by Serre, is equal to 2. And um, I'm sort of using more negatives than um, otherwise, because now I'm just going to say um, for the second line, if not. So in other words, <laughs> um, if it so happens that rho bar is um, très ramifié, that means the weight is p plus 1, and you stick an extra prime p um, on the level. And um, what's happening here is, if you think about it, is that n is some divisor of the um, conductor of the elliptic curve. The conductor of the elliptic curve, since E is semi-stable, is the product of the prime numbers at which E has bad reduction. And you can think of n as being the product of the prime numbers at which rho bar has bad reduction. Rho bar has bad reduction at a prime L different from P if it's ramified there. And it has bad reduction at p um, if it has this um, property of being très ramifié. So um, the goal that you want to achieve is um, to show um, that rho bar is modular, as I said, in a very restricted sense. And what that um, comes down to is the statement that rho arises from the space of weight two forms on um, gamma 0 of n. Um, so in other words, um, rho bar comes from a modular form um, of the type that you would think just by thinking about rho bar. 
Now, um, to give you some idea of um, what's going on, let's bring this down and move this. No, I don't want to do that. Let's um, move this one up. I want to indicate um, sort of three situations in which you have to um, apply this result if you want to prove, for example, Fermat's last theorem. So the first situation is a situation which has already been explained um, by Dick Gross in his talks. Namely, you imagine that you have um, hypothesized the existence of some um, solution to um, Fermat's last theorem with some exponent. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the prime p to be equal to L, and you are going to use the theorem um, proved by Wiles and Taylor Wiles to the effect that this E um, is not only semi stable, but is actually a modular elliptic curve. And what will happen is that um, because E is modular, when you look at the p or L division points of this elliptic curve, you get a modular representation. Thanks to a theorem of Mazur, this representation is irreducible. And thanks to this level lowering principle, uh, here you could just see it as a level um, precision principle because I haven't really um, said, um, although you may have felt the vibrations, that um, any level for rho bar is basically going to be a multiple of the integer that I've defined. Um, the level lowering principle will um, guarantee that you get into trouble, that you get a contradiction. Namely, the n for this particular example turns out to be 2. And we know there are no modular forms on gamma 0 of 2. Um, the second situation in which you want to apply this is the situation where you take um, e to be any elliptic curve, um, which is semi-stable over q. You don't yet know that it's modular. And you take p equals 3. And then you make the um, hypothesis for the moment that rho bar is irreducible. And what you'll find out in this situation is that rho bar is modular because of the theorems of Langlands and Tunnel. And um, then once you have the modularity of rho bar, you want to um, get a um, precise level for rho bar. And um, when you do that, you have um, achieved your goal. But maybe I should explain at the same time um, why it is that you want to have this goal. This would be some um, digression. Um, well, maybe um, what I'll do is next um, sort of talk about level C, uh, example C, and then go into the digression. So in example C, what will happen is that you'll take p equal to 5. And as one of the subsequent lecturers, I think Carl Rubin, will explain, um, what will happen very often is that you'll start with, or will happen with some frequency, is that you'll start with an elliptic curve for which it so happens that the three division representation is reducible. And then you look at the five division representation, and it'll turn out that um, this particular um, representation is irreducible. Otherwise, you can prove a priori that the elliptic curve couldn't have been semi-stable. And what you'd like to know is that this um, representation is modular. And what you do is you use an argument which um, many of you have seen um, discussed. Namely, you introduce another elliptic curve, which is semi-stable, which has the same five division representation as E, and which has an irreducible three division representation. And then if you go back to um, the machinery that's already been set up, you'll find out that that second elliptic curve is modular. Hence, its five division representation is modular. And therefore, um, since that's the same as E of 5, you'll discover that E of 5 is some modular representation. So you'll see that it is modular. And the situation is rather analogous to um, the situation which you encounter in um, number A. Namely, you'll find that it's modular. It comes from some space of forms of weight 2 on gamma 0 of some square free integer. That square free integer is, in fact, the conductor of the auxiliary elliptic curve that you introduced during your discussion. And so as in the case of situation A, 
what you're trying to do is you're trying to knock out primes from the level which occur with exponent 1. The situation for B is rather different if you think about um, the proof that rho bar is modular. What you do is you construct a weight 1 modular form. That weight 1 modular form will have in its level only the primes at which rho bar is ramified. And then you do some multiplication by Eisenstein series that has um, a 3 in its level. And what you'll discover is that this rho bar is modular. It's going to come from some gamma 0 of d, let's say, and weight 2, where d is an integer which has the right primes built into it, but they occur with high multiplicity. And so um, the situations in A and C are um, completely analogous. They're special, they're special cases of the principle that Dick Gross was talking about. Whereas um, in situation B, you have a rather different problem. And that's a problem which um, was encountered and studied and um, conquered in papers of um, Carreol and Edixhoven and um, also Gross himself. So this is a somewhat different problem. which um, I may um, come to during these lectures, but may just um, sort of not get into very much, except to allude to the fact that one can solve it. Now, what I'd like to do is explain um, one of the reasons that you want to solve this problem, and that's um, the following. If you think about um, the rho bar, and you ask, what does it mean that it comes from, um, let's say, some space S? This is some space of modular forms of given level and weight, and um, possibly the character um, could be specified. What does it mean to say that? Well, explicitly, what you have is the following situation. You're going to look in this space. And you're going to take some um, eigenform for the HECA operators. Um, so it's a HECA operator um, eigenvector. If you write its Fourier expansion, as people have done, is the sum of a sub n um, q to the n. It's a cusp form, sum from n equals 1 to infinity. You will discover that the eigenvalues for um, the HECA operators are multiples of um, these coefficients. Or more precisely, if you look at the, op the nth eigenvalue, um, the product of that and the first coefficient of f is going to be the nth coefficient of f. And so if you scale f, um, you sort of force f to be normalized, which is the usual convention, then the situation is that when you hit f with the nth Hakka operator, and traditionally the operator is written on the right, you just get a sub n times f. And what you do is you introduce the um, field of um, coefficients of this modular form. That field is traditionally called E. Um, maybe we could just call it F for the moment. This is going to be some finite um, dimensional um, extension of Q. It's a number field is what I'm trying to say. All of the A sub n's are algebraic numbers. In fact, they're algebraic integers, which lie in some fixed field. And um, it turns out that this f um, has a unique complex conjugation. It's either a totally real field, and that is the case if the Dirichlet character attached to the space is trivial, or else f is a um, CM field. It's a totally imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real field. So it's something that you um, feel fairly comfortable with. Inside of in this field, you have um, a ring O, which is just simply the ring of integers of f. And um, sitting inside of that as some order will be the ring generated by all of the coefficients of f. And now there are um, different ways of saying what it means to s what it, what it, what's the condition that rho bar come from the space s. And one of the possible ways of doing it is the following. Um, you take a prime ideal which um, divides p in the ring of integers of O. Now let's take such an ideal. It would be 
naturally um, gothic p, but in Wiles's paper, he calls it lambda. So let's take lambda, um, some prime of O, which divides p. And then what you can do is you can make a representation, which we could call rho lambda comma p, which goes from, um, I'm sorry, rho lambda comma f, which goes from the Galois group of q bar over q, that's just the group that I've been calling g, into um, GL2 um, O completed at lambda. And um, the situation is that if you take um, the residue map and you just map down to GL2 of O mod lambda, um, what should we call that? Maybe just GL2 O mod lambda and not burden it with a notation like K or F, which might be a weight or a field, um, respectively. If you take this um, residual map, what you'd like is that this should be um, essentially rho bar. Now, in the case where rho bar um, is taking values in GL2 of the prime field, FP, um, there the situation is very easy to state. Um, the prime field lives naturally in O mod lambda. And you can literally ask that this diagram commute without um, imposing any further structure. And the point is that to say that rho bar comes from the space is just to say that one of these um, rho lambda f's is going to be some um, deformation of um, the residual representation rho bar. And um, as you could um, certainly see from Barry Mazur's last lecture, um, one of the points about um, discussing these deformations is that given a residual representation rho bar, it's not the case that you want to consider um, arbitrary um, vanilla um, deformations of rho bar, but you'd like to consider deformations that um, have some extra flavors, um, pineapple, if you will. I've been asked to, explain, to insert that word into my lecture, actually. Um, you want to consider um, deformations that um, satisfy extra local conditions. And the most natural thing would be if um, this representation rho lambda f satisfies the whole um, bestiary of local conditions that are satisfied by rho bar. So in other words, um, certainly you would like this representation rho lambda f to be ramified only at the places where rho bar is ramified. And if it should so happen that at a place L, different from P, um, rho bar has a very simple form when restricted to a decomposition group at P, um, you would like um, analogously rho lambda f to continue to have um, the same um, qualitative form. Now, um, one of the reasons that this is kind of a motivation for what's going on is that um, once you have rho uh, lambda f, where f comes from a space with um, special properties, let's say it's um, the space of forms of weight 2 on a specific group with a specific level that you know about, then you are um, in a good shape, you're in um, well placed to say um, local things about this representation. Um, in particular, the representation is ramified outside primes different from p which don't divide the level. But um, as has been alluded to in some previous lectures, even at primes dividing the level, you can read off information about these representations from information about the form. And I will certainly come to that um, in my next lecture. Now, I'd like to um, also rephrase the problem in some general sense by um, talking about a Hecke algebra formulation. <coughs> 
let's suppose that we're given some space of modular forms. Um, here I'm going to be fairly vague, but um, to, to have some precision to it, well, let's suppose that we have the space of weight two forms on some group. Um, well, I'll even be less vague. Let's say that the group has the form gamma zero of n. So now we're really um, cutting things down a bit. Um, then you've seen that um, on the space there are various commuting operators. There's an operator labeled T sub n for every integer n. Um, there are operators um, typically normally labeled diamond bracket D for D dividing um, D relatively prime to n taken mod um, n. But here if you look at the group gamma 0 of n as opposed to gamma 1 of n, um, those operators will all be trivial so I don't need to consider them. Um, one special point is that if you take a prime number q which divides n, um, people have talked about the atkin lehner operator u sub q which is a Hecke operator with a special definition and my convention is that um, if q happens to have the special form then um, the operator that I call t sub q is simply the atkin lehner operator which then has um, two names and these t sub n's have a lot of recursion relationships that connect them um, for example the most obvious one is that t sub n m is the product of Tn and Tm if n and m are relatively prime. And for n running over powers of a given prime, there are recursion relationships um, connecting up the T sub um, L to the alpha for um, different powers alpha. And um, the relationship is a little different according as L divides the level or not. Now, the algebra associated with this situation, the full algebra, that one would take is um, one of these bold faced T's and by definition it's the algebra or just ring generated by these operators thought of um, inside of the endomorphism ring of um, the vector space in question so in other words it's just the um, ring generated by the T sub n actually thought of as operators and um, as we've seen in some of the previous lectures, this has various geometric um, interpretations. Since I'm dealing with way two, um, we can talk about um, these Hecke operators as correspondences. And using the functoriality of the Jacobian, either the Albanese functoriality or the dual functoriality, you'll embed this ring as a ring of endomorphisms of um, the appropriate abelian variety. And the point is that if you have some eigenform as above, um, and Dick Gross also mentioned this, you get a character, you get a homomorphism from T to the ring um, O, which simply takes the nth Hecke operator to the um, nth eigenvalue of T sub n acting on the eigenvector in question. So this is what you get. And in particular, if you um, go and consider some maximal ideal lambda um, as above, you have a residue map. OK, we're cooked. <clears throat> you have a residue map from T can't carry three objects at once. Let's try this. You have a residue map from um, T to the residue field of lambda. And this is going to be some, if you take the composite, this composite, um, just call it alpha for the moment, will have some kernel. The kernel is going to be a maximal ideal of T. And you can define a priori, given a maximal ideal of one of these Hecke algebras, um, the um, well, a representation, I don't know if I should call it rho sub m or rho sub m bar. It's a representation of G into GL2 of the residue field. Of course, the residue field will necessarily be embedded in GL2 of O mod lambda, the way I've set things up. Um, you can define this a priori to be the unique semi-simple representation up to isomorphism, which has on Frobenius elements away from the ramified primes, the characteristic polynomial that 
Jacques Tillemin wrote down his lecture this morning. And um, one formulation of what it means for a um, given representation rho bar to come from a particular space is that um, rho bar m should in fact um, be isomorphic to rho bar. This will be um, wanted for um, some maximal ideal m of the Hecke algebra dividing p. So you can completely suppress mention of eigenforms f. What you can do is you can work um, very um, blithely with this Hecke algebra and not talk too much about particular eigenforms. And you can keep book on representations by using that kind of calculus. Oops, no, I don't want that. Now, um, one thing that I'd like to point out at this juncture is that there are lots of variants of this Hecke algebra T that one might want to define. And one of the reasons for um, avoiding um, the definition that I've given is precisely that if um, N, capital N, is sufficiently complicated multiplicatively, um, a number of these atkin lehner operators, U sub Q, will fail to be diagonalizable, which is to say that you will have some eigenvectors. You can simultaneously upper triangularize your operators, but you don't have a complete decomposition. Everything is not um, semi-simple. Semi and um, one way out of this is to define some um, modified algebra. And what you do um, is um, fairly flexible. So um, we'll call it T prime just for the moment. Um, and you can let T prime be the algebra generated inside T by some requirement um, on the indices N. So in other words, it's going to be the algebra generated by the TN where N is relatively prime to some integer, capital M. And what is capital M going to be for us? Well, capital M um, will be, um, let's say, the product of the prime P, which might cause some trouble later, and the level of the modular forms you're considering. And you might want to put in three or four other prime factors just to complicate um, M. Of course, what happens is that as you um, complicate M multiplicatively, you obviously, in terms of the definition, shrink down this ring T prime. And one of the things that you want to do is you want to keep track of how T prime shrinks down when you remove operators. And one of the things that um, people have known for a very long time is that it doesn't shrink down all that much. And um, it turns out that Wiles has to have a very good um, control of what happens when you remove operators in this sense. Um, and that's for the following reason. Um, as I've explained, the T, which you define above, namely the ring generated by all the operators, is um, somewhat horrible um, a priori if you try to think of it in terms of um, nilpotent elements, um, elements that fail to be semi-simple. But on the other hand, it has the rather um, pleasant property, essential property, in fact, which we've seen this morning, of being Gorenstein. And the reason it's Gorenstein when you come down to it is that you have to use some Q expansion principle. The Q expansion principle says that some power series, some modular form is determined by a power series. The power series is determined by all of its coefficients. And when you want to talk about all of its coefficients, you do not want to take only those coefficients that are relatively prime to M. So you have um, the sort of good property of T being Gorenstein. Um, on the other hand, T prime doesn't seem to be Gorenstein a priori, although you will be able to prove um, that it is Gorenstein locally at certain primes if you are able to show that um, locally at a given prime there's no discrepancy between T and T prime. Um, on the other hand, as I do want to um, explain now to some extent, this T prime um, is um, at least in a superficial sense, a much more pleasant ring than T. 
um, in that you can just um, view it as being an order in a product of rings of the form O sub f, um, which were occurring above. So um, how do you do that? Well, the point is that I've defined um, various characters um, from T to rings O. Um, and of course, we can um, just um, restrict those characters to T prime. So what's happening is that you get various um, characters. Character just means a homomorphism of rings from T prime to um, various rings O sub f, where O sub f um, in, this, where in this context is, is the ring of integers of a number field. And f um, is um, constrained to be um, some eigenform in the space f, in the space s, sorry. And the theorem that you have is the T prime actually embeds as a product of finite index, as a subring of finite index in a suitable product of these rings O sub f. Um, here you're going to take a product over eigenforms f. And um, the product that you take is very easy to describe. I'm going to do that now. namely. Um, first of all, you should assume that F is a new form on some group um, gamma 0, well, let's call it um, D, where D is a divisor of N. Now, what does that mean? Well, it just means um, there are different ways to say it. There's this whole theory of new forms, which was started by Atkin and Lehner around 1970. And um, the point um, maybe could be stated succinctly in the following way. Um, as Jerry Tunnell mentioned in his lecture, every time you have an eigenform, you have kind of secretly available to you some object in um, the theory of um, representations of adelic groups. Namely, you associate to this some automorphic representation which um, locally is going to be something like a tensor product of representations of the completion, GL2 of the various completions of Q. And um, the um, automorphic representation that you get will have a level. And what you want is for F to really have the same level as the associated automorphic representation. If it does, um, it's going to be a new form. That's one way to say it. And the point is that you want to look at new forms, but of course the levels of these new forms may not actually be equal to n. They may be um, some divisors of n. So we just um, take only those new forms. And um, simultaneously, so that restricts it by taking a subset. And simultaneously, you want to take representatives for some um, equivalence relation. Namely, what you want to do is you want to take these new forms to be modulo um, Galois conjugation of their coefficients. So to give you some example of the last um, sort of um, condition, um, maybe I'll go um, back to the left-hand side of this board. I can do an example that um, is actually um, quite instructive, namely, um, let's just take um, n to be a prime. And in particular, we'll take n equal 23. That prime occurred in the last lecture as well. And the space that we'll take will be the space of way two forms on gamma 0 of 23. And now um, what happens is that if you take the ring, um, which I've called T, the full Hecke ring, um, this is the ring of integers in um, a particular um, totally real field. Um, in, in fact, in a real quadratic field is what I wanted to say. It's the ring of integers in Q the square root of 5. And now um, what happens is that there are two eigenforms in the space, normalized eigenforms. They're both new forms already because there are no forms of level 1, which is the only um, divisor of 23 that's different from 23. But these new forms have coefficients in the um, ring of integers of q to the square root of 5. And these new forms are just Galois conjugate to each other. You get from one to the other by changing the sign of the square root of 5. And of course, the t 
is really going to be equal to this ring of integers. It's not going to be equal to the ring of integers cross itself, which is what you would get if you took both new forms to try to make the product. Um, on the other hand, an interesting fact is that if you take um, m equal to 2, in other words, um, if you take only those HECA operators which are prime to 2, and you look inside um, to see what t prime is, and here I'm violating my convention that m should be divisible by the level, but um, so what? Um, if you look and see what t prime is, t prime in this case is um, the order of index 2. In other words, the HECA algebra can shrink a little bit when you remove primes, but it does so only in a very mild way. Um, so um, what can I say now? Just simply that the T prime that you get will have finite index in some product of rings of integers of number fields. Um, this, of course, is a ring that we think we understand um, very well. Um, being an order inside complicates matters quite a bit. For example, it's a very strong assertion on such an order to say that it's Gorenstein. Um, nevertheless, um, I think that most of us will feel more comfortable with this T prime than we would with a T, an overring of T, which um, may have some nilpotence. And um, finally, um, what I can say in terms of our goal is that it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever whether you want to consider T prime or T in terms of um, getting representations. Namely, um, if you have um, a maximal ideal of T prime, it can certainly be extended to a maximal ideal of T. And so um, to say, for example, that rho bar um, comes from S is just simply the assertion. Um, here's one way to say it in terms of homomorphisms where you don't explicitly see maximal ideals. Rho bar comes from S um, if and only if there's a homomorphism. from um, T prime to um, FP. And why do I write FP? Well, first of all, I'm thinking of our original situation where we had a representation which was linear over FP. And the homomorphism is supposed to have the property that if you take a HECA operator T sub L, where L um, is a prime number um, different from P and not dividing the level, in other words, a prime which is unramified, um, in um, the representation, yeah, um, now I should stop in mid-sentence and say that um, this really only makes sense if the level already includes the primes at which um, rho bar is ramified. So um, I think but by any stretch of the imagination, you would never expect a rho bar to come from a space where you didn't see the ramifying primes in the level. So we assume they're there. And then the condition is that there should be a homomorphism from T prime to F, which takes TL to the trace of rho bar of a Frobenius element for L in the Galois group of Q. And you see this homomorphism is really FP valued because we are um, forcing the generators to go um, to specific elements of FP. A homomorphism um, with this property is unique if it exists. And um, the existence is exactly some stringent statement that rho bar can be realized in S. Um, if you try to extend this homomorphism to the overring T, then um, it may well happen that the homomorphism does not extend to a homomorphism from T prime to FP, but it'll extend to a homomorphism from um, T prime to FP bar, or if you like, to some um, finite extension of FP. Okay, so now I want to um, state some um, variant of the theorem that Dick was talking about in his um, last lecture. And as I said in the beginning of this hour, this is the kind of theorem that's used um, in two of the three situations where you need to make the level of the form precise, level and weight, in fact. 
So um, what is this theorem? So the idea is the following. You're going to be given some representation from um, the Galois group of Q to, um, well, let's say GL2F, where F is a finite field, an extension of um, QP, uh, of FP. Um, you want to assume, first of all, that it's irreducible. And secondly, um, you want to assume that it comes from the space of weight two forms on um, the group gamma. And what group gamma is that? Well, we're going to take gamma to be um, the intersection of gamma zero of L, let's say, where L is a prime number, which in fact may or may not be equal to P, with a group which um, could be taken to be gamma one of M or it could be taken to be gamma zero of M. Um, here, the main point is that M should um, definitely be relatively prime to um, L. In the case where the group is gamma zero of M, then gamma is just gamma zero L times M. And of course, um, you would expect in this situation, normally that rho bar would be um, ramified at L. So um, I'm mixing up Roman and um, well, different kinds of numerals. Now let's say that it's irreducible, that it comes from um, the space that I've indicated. And we also want to assume that this rho bar is um, finite and flat at L. Now in other words, it's um, not ramified at L if L is different from P. And um, if L um, is equal to P, then it has this magic property, which um, Dick explained, which uh, makes you think that um, rho bar um, shouldn't involve L at all. OK, and now the desired conclusion is that, um, well, the desired conclusion is that rho bar should come from S2 of um, this group here. In fact, we could give a name to this group. Let's just call it gamma prime. And then what is desired is that rho bar should come from S2 of gamma prime. And this is actually true in two situations. OK. Um, the first of the situations is the one which um, Dick has talked about and which um, is really sufficient for Wiles' purposes. Namely, that's the situation in which P is an odd prime. Now here, um, this is um, sort of basically um, my theorem. It's the thing that Dick was talking about, except that in all the articles that I ever wrote about it, I always assumed that gamma prime was gamma zero of M. And the generalization, or the variant, in which gamma prime is gamma 1 of M instead is discussed by Fred Diamond in his article in the Red Book that International Press is selling um, at the front of the building. So it's a recent article by Diamond that kind of removes the restriction. And now, it turns out, if, if you're interested in um, generalizations, a very natural thing is to replace this group by some group that's intermediate between the two. And you can certainly do that if P is at least 5, but there are some um, weird counterexamples when P is equal to 3. But these are exactly the counterexamples that um, get removed when Wiles makes his hypothesis that if you have a mod P representation, it has some extra irreducibility property when you pull back to the Galois group of Q to the square root of minus 3. But that's just a technical aside. And um, the second situation in which it's true, this includes the case where P is equal to 2, um, but it's kind of a, a slightly um, different proof, is that this is true if you assume um, some um, sort of extra structure to gamma prime. So let's say it's true if gamma prime um, has the form um, gamma zero of something, I don't know what to call it, maybe I'll just call it um, gamma zero of n, in fact, because n hasn't been used, um, intersect 
gamma 0 of q. So gamma prime is just n times q. But we assume here that q is multiplicatively disjoint from n and l and p. Um, maybe I'll just say that q is a prime. I won't write that, which doesn't divide the product of n, um, p, and l. So it's really some or other prime in, in the picture. And um, the situation here is that you want to assume that rho bar is actually ramified at um, q. Now, as Dick explained in his lecture, um, you could um, imagine applying this theorem to the case when you have a Fermat curve and you take exponent p and you take the p division point. So p is a very large prime. And the prime q that you would take in that situation would be the prime q. It so happens if you look at the Fry curve because of this 2 to the minus 8 in the formula for the minimal discriminant that um, there is some ramification at 2. And um, of course, it would be absolutely great to um, unify these two situations, namely to extend um, the desired result from the case of odd primes p to arbitrary primes p. Um, I don't know of work in that direction, and I also don't know of any counterexamples. I mean, I don't think it's been um, very um, carefully worked out. Now, um, what I'd like to do in um, the next few minutes is to try to explain one or two of the elements of the proof of this theorem. Um, and to sort of justify my doing that, I will report that um, a couple of members of the audience asked me for sort of more details on what the um, sort of motivating principle was that made the proof work. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to think a little bit about situation B. And I'd like to think about situation B um, in the case which is absolutely free of extraneous notation. So, um, I want to think about the situation. Probably in this lecture, there have been um, several situations that have been called situation B. But I want to think about situation B in that, um, with that meaning. In other words, I want to think that um, rho bar comes from um, just the simplest possible thing, gamma 0 LQ. And to sort of keep everything straight, you can think that L and Q are distinct from each other and distinct from P. This is really the simplest possible case. And you want to assume that rho bar is ramified at Q. It's not finite at Q, but unramified at L. And you would like to deduce from this, um, that's your desired goal. You would like to deduce from this that um, what's going on is that rho bar should be, um, in fact, um, coming from, so rho bar comes from, um, gamma 0 of q. In other words, you can explain the absence of ramification at L. And now, when you do this, you have um, lots of um, sort of things to worry about. And what I will do is sort of confuse the issue more by sort of forgetting about the algebra t. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write simply um, t for what I call t prime. And in other words, I'll just think to um, keep the um, idea simplest, I'll just think that t is really generated by the Hecke operators t sub n, where n is prime at least to l and q, and you might as well throw p in there as well. So just take a reduced kind of Hecke algebra. And now um, t, as we've seen, is going to be in some product, or maybe you'd prefer to think of it as a direct sum, of um, these various rings, O sub f. And O sub f has um, the property, well, what is f? f is going to be a new form of some level dividing LQ. So in other words, um, the conductor or the level of f um, divides LQ. And there are going to be three possibilities for um, the level, namely the level can't be 1, but it could be L or it could be Q. Um, and 
um, it, of course, could be L times Q. And corresponding to these possibilities or unions of these possibilities, there are various partial products in this um, direct sum to mix metaphors. And if you project T onto these partial products, you will get um, lots of um, interesting quotients. For example, um, some obvious quotient that you could have um, might be dubbed T bar. This is going to be the new quotient. And T bar um, is just going to be defined to be the image of T. I won't write of T, but the image of T in the product of the O sub Fs, where now the level of F is really equal to L times Q. And you can have, um, to reuse some of this terminology this morning, you can have the Q nu quotient where you just took levels which are divisible by Q and the L nu quotient, and you can have the old quotient where the level is either L or Q. And um, what's a sort of amazing thing that happens if you um, think about the um, guiding principle of um, functoriality in the sense of Jacques Langlands is that you can get an action of T bar on some abelian variety which is some um, variant in the sense of quaternion algebras of um, the abelian variety J0 LQ. J0 LQ is of course associated to modular forms, cusp forms of weight 2 on gamma 0 LQ. And what is that? Well, as um, at least one of the speakers has mentioned before, it's kind of natural in this context to think about the algebra. Um, I think the name D was used for it. This is going to be um, the quaternion algebra over Q of reduced discriminant L times Q. So this means that if you um, look at this thing locally at a prime, you get a matrix algebra, except locally at L and locally at Q, you actually get some division algebra. So you can take this thing, and this is, of course, in some analogy that you would make. This is analogous to M2 of Q. Um, the analogy may or may not be a good one. This is another quaternion algebra. And you can make some group gamma inside which is analogous to SL2Z. Um, namely, you take a maximal order of D that corresponds to M2 of Z. Um, you take um, the units of um, reduced norm 1. That would correspond to SL2Z. And because the thing is split in infinity, it operates on the upper half plane. And you can make a quotient which um, is completely analogous to um, a standard modular curve. In fact, this is even considered in Shimura's book. And um, what you get is some curve C, which is called a Shimura curve. And the reason why this um, may not be um, a completely good analogy to link up this quaternion algebra with M2 of Q is that, um, in fact, when you take this gamma, it has some of the properties of SL2Z but it has some of the properties of gamma 0 LQ. For example, its discriminant is LQ, just like the discriminant. Well, the discriminant, it's the units in an order. The maximal order has um, discriminant LQ, just like gamma 0 LQ is um, the group of units in some order of SL2Z, whose discriminant is LQ. But be that as, as it may, you have some um, completely parallel universe with the Shimura curves and the modular curves. And in particular, you can take the Jacobian of this thing, um, which I just call J. Um, if I had thin chalk, I would maybe write Shimura under J, but just call it J. And um, this is some um, object which you sort of gradually understand from the point of view of Jacques Langland's theory to be a geometrical realization of the space of new forms of level LQ. And the way that this comes out in the end is the following. You see, you have some family of operators called T sub n on this um, modular curve C and its Jacobian J. And if you like, you can just make the formal polynomial ring, um, call it T sub T with a big 
um, t or something. This is just going to be polynomials in the um, in some variables labeled t sub n, and this thing, of course, is going to act on the modular curve as correspondences. It'll act on as Jacobian as a family as a ring of endomorphisms, and um, this um, arrow, of course, just takes the sort of formal variable t n to an actual operator, which is called t sub n in here, which is some operator on an abelian variety. And um, one quotient of this formal polynomial algebra is the ring t, which is upstairs. And of course, um, another quotient, a further quotient, is the one that I've introduced, which you can call t bar. And t bar, um, well, for example, if you want some geometrical realization of it, it actually acts on a specific quotient of the abelian variety J0 LQ. It's the quotient which is defined to be the new quotient. You can do operations on modular forms um, in some um, parallel with operations on modular curves and their Jacobians. And the assertion, which is um, now um, fairly obvious to you, perhaps, and, and, but it's not obvious to me how to um, label this on the board, is that we have this homomorphism like this. And in fact, this homomorphism factors. Maybe the best way to say it is that it factors through this quotient, <coughs> which then acts faithfully on J. In other words, it's exactly the same physical ring, free of finite um, rank over Z, which operates both on this abelian variety and on this abelian variety. And furthermore, um, the arrow is just the arrow you think, namely the operator T sub n, um, of course, goes to the Hecke operator T sub n here. So that you have an isomorphism between Hecke rings taking T sub n in one universe to T sub n in the other. And that's a sort of very strong thing to have. And that is um, one form of a geometrical realization of um, the Jacques Langlands correspondence in this very simple case. Now, let me just say one or two things to close. Um, one very um, well-known open problem, which doesn't seem to have a neat solution, is to try to strengthen that um, geometrical relationship by having um, a direct isogeny between the two abelian varieties that I've written here, an isogeny which is equivariant with respect to the Hecke operators and which is defined by some natural geometrical process. This um, problem was raised, um, I think, around 1978. Um, first by Kajdan, I believe, and other people, including Mazur. And it has a sort of um, dumb solution in the sense that you can prove that there is an isogeny, for example, by using Faulting's theorem, um, which was the Tate conjecture for abelian varieties. But it doesn't have a good solution in the sense that you can actually exhibit one. And it was in an attempt to try to find a solution to this problem that I began looking at the fine structure of these abelian varieties. And in particular, um, both abelian varieties have bad reduction at the primes L and Q. And it was natural to compare the reductions of the two varieties at one of these primes. And the thing that um, completely knocked me out, in which I sort of don't really understand fully, is that what happened was rather the opposite. Namely, if you reduce J0 LQ at one of the primes, say L, then it's what you get is directly related to the reduction of J at the other prime, say Q. And this is related to a theorem of um, Cherednik and Drinfeld, which is called exchanging invariance. And these invariants really exchange. And the proof of the, um, the theorem, which is now gone from the boards, but this idea of trying to lower level is um, a fairly indirect one. You assume that you cannot lower the level, so things are set up exactly so that there are some quotients of the Hecke algebra which can give you a given representation, but others that cannot. And you try to keep track of some dimensions or lengths um, in various reductions of these two abelian varieties. And you use the fact that things cross to get some funny inequality, which can only be verified if everything is 0. And that makes a contradiction, which proves the theorem. But it's somewhat unsatisfactory, because it's a real proof by contradiction that underlies the whole thing. And um, you kind of live in some universe where you're assuming that something is not true, but you know fully well that it is. And you kind of get into trouble. Okay.